I'm your host, Steph Roberts, and today I'm excited uh, to talk about something that I think is going to be super helpful to everyone who feels triggered in any way at any time. And I have some content coming up that really inspired me to want to bring somebody on who's qualified to help us through some quick tips and even some longer term techniques for how to really help when we get these anxious moments, we feel just totally flooded with fear and energy and all these things. So today I have Stacy Every with me. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you. So, so pleased to be here. Yeah. So we met just, was it last weekend? I think two yeah. weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And, and that was a happy thing too. We sat next to each other at this card reading. This, that, that was called what? Tarot swirl. Tarot swirl. That's it. Yeah. Never been to one of those before. It was really fun. We were seated next to each other for a very long amount of time, but <laughs> it was wonderful. But then we got up and like, wait a minute, who are you? <laughs> I spent the whole day with you, but I don't know who you are. So it was really fun to hear your background. But so tell us about what you do. You're here to talk to us about trauma and getting through trauma. So I am a a uh, trauma-informed um, EFT practitioner, and that stands for Emotional Freedom Technique, and it's a tapping therapy that I'll be teaching everyone at some point in the podcast. But I have a—I mean, I was a long-term educator before I got involved with alternative health. I'm a body worker, Reiki master, an energy worker, and I've been just involved with traumatic response and survival response, and the body and body mind heart connections for oh god, I guess a dozen years now or so. I've got jumped in and um, never left, never left the pool. <laughs> so glad to be here to talk about just in my work. So much of what I do is the fusion of there's the, the stuff we know with our intellect, the stuff mm -hmm. and, the, and then there's, and then there's making meaning out of what happens to us. And then there's the piece of it where um, our body is so heavily involved with our experiences in a way that most of us don't understand or have access to because frankly, our bodies have been ignored completely. And in, in our understanding of our emotions and it's like the body response is just not discussed or even acknowledged. Unfortunately, even still in psychotherapy circles, it's all very, very intellectual focused, mind focused and EFT and a lot of the other practices I'm going to talk about acknowledges that that the uh, experiences we have become lodged in our bodies and our nervous systems in our brains, but not in our conscious minds that our our conscious mind makes tries to make meaning out of what happens to us, but our our, the primitive parts of our brain has a much more, it's made for survival. <laughs> so our, most of our brain is, an, we're animals first and survival is the priority, not happiness. And so when we are young and we have experiences in our lives, we are always looking for how to survive because safety and belonging are always the primary goals. Mm. And they're related to each other, right? If we, because when we're children, we're very vulnerable. And so if we don't feel like we belong, literally in the old days, if you didn't belong to a family, you were going to die. You had mm -hmm. to have the adults in your life taking care of you. And that's still true. The, the human animal still feels that very deeply. And we need to feel safe with those adults in our lives. And so we have experiences that we, and when we're young and even when we're older too, like this adverse experiences can happen at any time. And the nervous system says, oh, this situation is dangerous. And we need to make sure we are safe in this situation. And we generally have three uh, responses. We can either uh, run away with flight, mm -hmm. we, can, we can fight, or we can freeze. And, and what of those three things our bodies choose to do is you know, dependent on cultural. Women, I think, tend to go for freeze more. Men yeah. go for fight more um, because of how we're, we're conditioned. Sure. So, so much of what we do is our adaptations or conditioning, it's habits we develop. Mm -hmm. And so those habits get programmed into the part of our brain we don't have access to. And so when we have a situation that reminds us in any way of an original experience that where we felt unsafe, mm -hmm. then say, say, for example, I, I use the angry boss. So you have a boss who yells at you and you instantly freeze because and you don't even know why. But maybe when you were young, you had a caregiver who yelled a lot and you would always um, uh, run away from that. that no the noise made you feel unsafe of someone yelling. That makes sense. And so once you're an adult, your body remembers that and says there's a loud voice 
and it goes right to that freeze response. And you afterwards, you may think, you know, why did I freeze? Why didn't I stand up for myself? Why didn't I say something? But that's this part of your, that's your thinking part of your brain saying that part of your brain gets totally derailed when you're in a situation that your body thinks is unsafe. It's fascinating. And, and you have this re reflexive response where you automatically go into freeze or you automatically back off or you start trying to placate or you start to fight, depending on what your particular response was back in those days, you repeat it over and over again. So my little introduction to it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that piece is really important because, you know, as an adult, when you're let's say you're in the middle of a bad relationship with anybody in your life, or you're finally coming to terms with the fact that it isn't healthy for you and you're trying to leave that situation and things are escalating and you're educating yourself. We talked about this before we started recording and maybe now let's, we'll use the narcissist or the emotional abuse piece. If you're doing research on that and you're finding, oh, that that is the label for this experience that I've had for 10 years, 15, 20, whatever, I didn't even know this was a thing because you maybe were never, there was no physical violence or anything like that. And you're, but you're beginning to understand it and you're immersing yourself in it and you're trying to educate yourself and maybe you're even armed with phrases and how to handle it. But then that happens and you're like, what's going on? So I think that's a really good point is even though you have all the data intellectually, your body takes over and is like, well, I'm at the wheel <laughs> and I'm going to be in control of what you say, what you do or how you feel in your body. So I think to me, that's the essence of this whole trauma thing. Absolutely. And, and, and trauma, you know, the word trauma because of PTSD, I think has taken on connotations like in order to have trauma affect you, it has to be drastic it has to be some right. terrible event watching someone die in front of you but there's there's a lot there's so much research done and i could talk all about our own country and how we view this issue but i mm. won't <laughs> but what it, what it comes down to is there's lots of kinds of trauma and i know they, they now they tend to use the, the term their aces adverse childhood experiences instead yeah. because what one person experiences as perfectly fine someone else experiences as a terrible incident that fundamentally changes how they perceive the whole world. And it depends on so many things. And a huge part of that is whether you, if you feel like you have safe people in your life who are always supporting you mm -hmm. as a child, you're way more resilient. Mm -hmm. And our caregivers do the best they can, but they were raised by their own caregivers who had their own, and it, with all the numbers of wars we've had and um, there's a lot of evidence about war itself creates traumatized individuals who then transfer their trauma onto their children because they were, and because so often veterans did not have their mental health addressed at all. And that continues, seems to continue to happen over and over again with every war we have. So that's just one, but anyway, that's the war piece of it. But even just having a, a, t a teacher who consistently bullies you, having, I mean, there's obviously the far end of the spectrum where you're sexually abused, emotionally abused, physically abused every day and you're in your own home. Mm. You know, it's you know, complex trauma. Okay. But even just having a mother who's, who's depressed and distant and you don't feel a strong connection to her can make a child feel very unsafe. Right. And once the world is unsafe, that shapes your vision of the world, of yourself, how valuable you are, when a caregiver is unable to be fully present for you as a child. So they said, I prefer to use adverse childhood experiences because so, people tend to brush it off. Oh, that's just, yeah, I was in a car accident, but it was just that one time. It was, I didn't get that badly hurt. When actually their bodies may be dreadfully afraid of cars and they don't even know why they're anxious when they drive from then on, but their bodies remember the accidents and they, so the, the sweating, the heart palpitations, the different body responses we have is an indicator that there's some, there's some survival response that our brains are engaged in that we don't have conscious, maybe even conscious knowledge about at all. So with all of that in mind, again, one of the reasons why I had you on is I try to cover content on this podcast that is more positive, helpful, but the truth is that there's a lot of information that I want to share that I know is possibly triggering. But at the same time, if you know these things, then you can work to prevent them from impacting you. Right. And yeah. so one of the things that I've been talking about recently is the re-abuse and 
um, um, collaborative almost abuse within the family court system and specifically with mothers and children. And there are some people who are not divorced who are in who are mothers or women in these scenarios where they're getting divorced and maybe they're in an emotionally abusive or physically abusive situation. And the assumption is always the courts are supposed to protect me and I'm the mom. So of course they're gonna lean toward my children staying with me. And I would love to believe that's true. And some people would say that's really old fashioned, but whatever stance you take, the truth is that that is not necessarily gonna be the case. And in fact, there's a lot of, there's the whole movement to readjust the court system, to re-educate them for what abuse looks like. What are the long-term effects of putting these children? Women are encouraged to get a restraining order against their husband. And then voila, after this court situation happens, their children are sent to be with that same person on a regular basis and experience all those things, but now without the comfort of their safe parent. Mm. These are very, very scary thoughts, but this is reality and this is how it works. And so I have somebody I'm interviewing and her story is pretty, pretty impactful and dramatic. And I know that it will be triggering to some people. So what I wanted to do is be responsible and <laughs> try to have you on first because Along with that story, there are many things that will crop up. And I know even just retelling this, I'm remembering in my body, many of the things that happened to me when I left and things related to my kids, the court system, lawyers, therapists, scary things, and would love to hear more about what are the things we can do when we start to feel fear, we'll just call it a trigger because I think that's what everybody's using. These mm -hmm. triggers where we're like, I can't watch that anymore. I can't listen. What are some things that we can do? And by the way, P.S., if, if you don't think you should be listening or watching, please don't. Please turn it off. Yeah, yeah that's actually my first. It's, it's one of the benefits of the trigger warning awareness is that lots of content now has has them. If the, if the topic of the video or article you're reading is something you've experienced yourself to think very carefully about whether you want to read it. Um, being re-traumatized is a real thing. And um, one thing about trauma is you can actually wear a groove in your brain of thinking about the trauma story, telling the trauma story uh, over and over again, and not to say you shouldn't tell it and be witness. That's absolutely a huge part of the healing process is having a compassionate person who sees you and understands hear the traumatic experience you've had and say, yes, that was awful. And I'm, yeah, and, and I'm here for you. Right. And then after that, it's important to get other kinds of help to help heal the nervous system because the conscious brain isn't able to really do much about it at that point. And so anyway, so keeping yourself safe is avoiding being re-traumatized is I'd say number one. Um, number two is to make sure you're really centered and grounded and happy and comfortable before you start to read. Get yourself to a place of feeling safe in the first place before even attempting to go with the video or the article. And if you find, and, and actually, in fact, the first thing to do if you are reading something and you're feeling really triggered is stop reading. Just yeah. put it down. And at that point, the two the two techniques. One is to look out the window is actually mm -hmm. very useful or, mm -hmm. or going outside, you know, even just putting everything down, it's getting up and moving and stepping outside. Moving your body when you're having um, that kind of reaction helps to disperse some of the energy. It's like literally an, an energy buildup that we get in our system. That's why EFT works is to help release the energy. So moving your body is very helpful. And then, or if you can't really get away to at least look around the room, the, the most effective way to do that is to take a nice deep breath and moving both your head and your head, uh, your head as well as your eyes to actually take in your surroundings and remind yourself of where you are and looking at the details of the room, the colors of the walls, the objects that are in the room to bring yourself back to the present moment. Okay. Triggers specifically bring our bodies kind of back to the original uh, traumatic experience. And we want to bring ourselves back into the present away from the past. Anxiety is in fact, mostly fueled by, you know, it's fueled by the past and the future. It's never in the present moment. Yeah. I like that. That's really, I mean, I'm big on going outside and grounding and anybody who listens has heard that a million times, but that, that technique, that's awesome. Just yeah. Internal in the room kind of, that makes sense because it's almost like, especially for people who've left their bodies, literally 
to yes. physical sexual violence, they may need to really pull everything back into this moment. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up for when you're feeling dissociated and like you're not quite present. Another thing to do for that is to like feel the skin of your own body, not inside, but the outside. So feeling mm -hmm. your feet as they sit on the floor mm -hmm. and feeling the texture of the floor beneath your feet, feeling your bottom as it sits in the chair and the pressure on the chair and the, your back against your chair. Or maybe you know, put your hands on your legs and feel the sensation of your hands on your legs. You're really kind of being aware of like the feeling of your clothes on your body and having a sense of your, a sense of your body without necessarily going into the internal sensations, just the external ones, just like feeling your own skin, feeling your own physical container. Let's see here. Make sure I get, don't forget anything. <laughs> okay. People often tout breathing techniques mm -hmm. and they do work really well for a lot of people. And when it comes to soothing that, rea that survival response reaction, the breath and socially engaging with someone who we love and we know loves us are often two of the most uh, effective and rapid ways we can do that. So like, simply finding someone you love and saying, I'm not having a hard time right now. Can you give me a hug is enormously helpful. Looking into their eyes, holding the hug for at least 20 seconds, get the, horm the mm -hmm. hormones going is going to bring you back to your body and even just calm your whole nervous system right down. Okay. Yeah. With breathing, if you have had experiences with breathing and you think, I don't really like it, I feel deeply uncomfortable when I take deep breaths, and, and, and you may even feel like, what's wrong with me? Everyone else seems to love deep breathing. When you've had significant, not even significant, when you've had trauma, one of the body's reactions might be to keep you out of it, right? So deep breathing can kick up um, our own body sense quite a bit, which eventually is really good for us when we can learn to do that safely. But when you're on your beginning your healing journey and if you haven't you know don't really feel your body very well anymore deep breathing can force you to do something you're not ready for yet it can force you to feel your body in a way you haven't for years a part of you feels that your brain thinks is unsafe okay. and so you're better off so you're not crazy you're it's not <laughs> weird it's actually a very common protection protection response is to keep you out of your body okay. if you have a lot of trauma and adverse experiences in your life so for those of you who do like breathing techniques, <clears throat> one, a, a very simple one is you breathe in for a count of six and breathe out for a count of six. So you're really, and then you're paying attention to being gentle with your breath and slowly filling your lungs up and then slowly releasing the air out again mm -hmm. and bringing some awareness to how your chest feels as you're breathing, you know, feeling the, the the chest going in and out, ideally being able to soften the stomach and letting the stomach muscles be allow the air to fill the stomach. But activating the diaphragm in that way is also very good to bring your nervous system down to, to feeling calm again. And simply paying attention to your breath as you breathe is also, it helps to bring you back to the body and away from the, the trigger. Um, and then finally, something I actually suggest everyone does is to, and then I'll get into EFT, which I okay. love, um, is to write down a list of resources you have. All your resources you have in your life, it's like a gratitude practice, all mm -hmm. the things you're thankful for. And that includes, you know, the people in your life who you know you can go to if you have any issues at all, the skills you have, like any skill you have, be it you know, maybe your, your, your journal or maybe you, um, it really any skill at all that you enjoy, something physical you like to do, be, actually, Exercise, in fact, being a really great way to get back into your being more centered and grounded as well. But anything you can think of that you know is good for you and is a resource to you, make a list okay. and remember it whenever you are feeling triggered and make use of it whenever you can. The more often it's a, so ex, I brought up the exercise analogy, teach, it's a training, it's an exercise to teach our body through practices how to come back to center, how to feel more grounded, how to become present again. And it's just like exercise where you practice, you do it every day to get good at it. If you want to learn how to play, play guitar, you practice every day. Right. And it's the same thing with mindfulness practices or breathing practices, just picking some things you do every day to help yourself feel that sense of grounded presence and just remembering you're not just your trauma, right? <laughs> that we are greater than the sum of our experiences that the soul connection, the larger self, we're here having our experiences on the planet. 
and a big picture view of what we are, right? Than just being, I am a white woman, white heterosexual woman living in the United States and who's a, who's an EFT practitioner or whatever you are in your moment in the planet. Okay. So any questions so far? So you're, yeah, just to recap on that one. So you're saying literally, so I am Latina, an amazing cook. I can dance. I play flute. I love reading. I'm a great photographer. I know how to do graphic design, whatever. I'm great with kids like that. Literally that level. It doesn't mean you're necessarily going and doing those things. You're listing it to yourself to reorient your identity and focus on, I guess, the good, right? Like this, these are stabilizing things. Absolutely. Just like we wear a groove where our, our, our adverse experiences can wear a groove into Mm -hmm a triggered reaction or survival response. So there's, we can we, uh, wear in the positive grooves as well to develop new habits for ourselves. Yeah, and I did an episode about this groove thing and talked a lot about Bruce Lipton and why affirmations, some people think they don't work, but why they can work if we just keep at it, like what, our internal dialogue. So I will put that in the show notes, but I just wanted to. I'd say one reason they don't work is because of the kind of triggered responses that we have that are built up in our nervous system that don't let us believe the affirmations. The lack of belief. Yeah. Yeah. When we have a belief that, you know, I'm not good enough, I am never going to accomplish anything, I can't be abundant, Mm -hmm. then saying, I am abundant, I am abundant every day, you're not going to make any, just the intellectual affirmation isn't going to make a lot of headway necessarily against the belief Mm -hmm. that, that you believe in your nervous system that you're not abundant. Right. So some of your affirmations actually have to match what you can believe, right? Like that's so yes. important. The words are so important because it's like, uh, that's bullshit. <laughs> it's like your body's like, no way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think saying the words is a first, uh, a great step towards repatterning that nervous system. And if you find that you, and but it's the moment when you feel stuck, like I'm saying yeah. the words, but I don't really believe it. Even though I've been yeah. saying them every day, that's a time to look elsewhere for some more healing or some Absolutely. more, you know, you find the root cause of why those beliefs are not taking hold. Right. Okay. I'm so glad you said that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I can teach EFT as well. Yay. So same thing with this. Uh, So emotional freedom technique is it's a tapping therapy. It's a great self-care tool to use whenever you're feeling, you can use it simply for anxiety. You're feeling anxious. Mm -hmm. You're having a moment, your regular techniques aren't, you aren't working. uh, And then you can tap a few rounds to help feel better. EFT can be used in a uh, myriad of ways and it can be very used very deeply for real trauma. That's the kind of um, using EFT to kind of tackle stuff that you know is deeply difficult is better off done with a skilled practitioner than by yourself. Okay. So the thing about the human brain is that one reason, as I said before, we expect our caregivers in our lives to help us feel safe. So we still need that. So we, maybe we never got it as a kid. Our brains still need it because we never got it as a kid. We need that therapist, that practitioner to, to work with us and to look into their eyes and to make that social, to have the social engagement happen. Okay. Feel safe around that original trigger, that original trauma to really heal the brain. So okay. you can tap on a trauma on your own. It might work to a point. It might also kick up a lot of really difficult emotions that are hard to manage on your own. So I caution anyone who's had a lot of really serious trauma to think about whether they want to use EFT or um, only use it with setting the intention of relaxation. Like really, I'm saying I'm just relaxing. I'm just relaxing. And and make that clear to yourself as you're tapping. And Stacey, so if you're saying you should be doing it with somebody else, you mean like literally in person or could they find a video where someone's showing you how to tap on a specific thing? Or do you feel like the comfort of another person is essential that person needs to see you so it it needs to be live yeah so yeah it's a shared experience okay it can be on zoom but it needs to be shared. right another yeah (laughs) okay got it got it okay yeah yeah okay uh with that in mind keep your put your feet on the floor and feel the pressure of your feet and take a little quick look around the room and be aware just re remind yourself of where you are in time and space and take a breath. And I'll, go through, I'll teach the points and uh, I'll pause and talk about it a little bit. So the first point is the side of the hand 
below the pinky on the meaty part of the side of the hand. And you can tap, you can, it's a lot of different options. You can tap the right hand on the left, the left hand on the right. You can rub the spot if you want to, or you can just hold the point if you want to. These are all based on acupuncture points, um, acupuncture, acupressure. It accesses the nervous system directly. And one reason why it's, um, and, and it, it, brings, it brings you into that rest, restful response, ideally. Then the next point is the top of the head. If you were to part your hair in the very middle, that's all four fingers. That's where you'd tap in the very center of the top of your head. And again, you can tap or rub or, or just hold. The next point is the inside corner of the eyebrow. So the eye, eyebrow point next to your, where your nose starts. And there's actually a little divot there. It's a cranial nerve comes out of the skull right at that point. So you're kind of tapping on your brain when you tap on that point. The next point is the other side of the eyebrow on the bony ridge of the eye socket. Kind of the, if you go on the side of your eye, that works too. All of these points are very forgiving. If you're thinking, I'm not quite sure what she's talking about. It's <laughs> yeah. gonna work. As long as you're in the vicinity, it's, it's fine. It's gonna Good work. Enough. Okay. The next point is under the eye, right uh, below where the pupil is on the eye socket, um, kind of right where the cheekbones, above where the cheekbone is, but it's, it's basically the eye socket. And there's again, a little divot right there where another nerve comes out of the, out of the skull. The next point is under the nose, above the upper lip. It's actually where the joke is, you know, when you, you don't want to sneeze, you, you know, you hold your, hold the, the cartoon, <laughs> hold the finger there. Okay. It actually does suppress the sneeze response to activate this point. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of funny. The next point is the crease of the chin. So below the lower lip and above where the chin sticks out. The next point is on the collarbones. So on the inside where the collarbones meet, there's like a U shape. You can feel the two knobs of the of the um, the inside of the collarbones, and you can tap that area too. If you're not sure what where it is, you can take your whole hand and just tap the general area below your throat. It's like below the it's below the uh, Adam's apple, well below the throat actually. You just hit the whole area if you want to be on the safe side. <laughs> the next point is under the arm. It's on the rib cage. For women, it's on the bra line, um, parallel to the nipple, and basically it's right in the center of the ribs on your side. So you're lifting your arm and kind of tapping. It's easier if you lift your arm up in the air and then tap on the on the side of the body with the whole the whole top, you know, right. palm of your hand. And the next point is the inside of the wrist right below the hand, the um, yeah, on your wrist on the below the palm. And then back to the side of the hand again. Below the pinky. <clears throat> Excuse me, below the pinky. Okay. Or this is on YouTube if you're listening. Yes, yeah, <laughs> so listen to the podcast and you want to see. You're like, what the heck? You're doing a great job, Stacy, describing. But just in case they want to see visuals, visual aids are often a little simpler to deal with. And yeah, and that, that's all. Those are the ten points that I use. Now there's okay lots of variations. Some people use eight points. Some use six. Some some use the sternum. Some use other points instead. There's a million acupuncture points that act basically the, 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 the principle is you're activating all 14 meridians of the energy system. Mm. And a lot of these points overlap. So it's, it, so it's all, it's all good. You may think, well, you know, is she wrong? And these people are right. We're all right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all the, all those points that you may find online are going to work. It's um, and you may find certain points feel better to you than others. Um, and some points may feel sore. And mm -hmm. actually, if you find a point that feels sore to you, you should linger on that point because there's something about that point, that energy channel that needs, that could use some activation and is going to um, help okay. clear what's ever going on in that part of your energy system. Okay. So those are the points. So yeah, so simply uh, a technique to use EFT for is um, I'm anxious, I'm upset, is simply to breathe and tap. You just breathe at each point. You can go in, you know, in and out at each point and say, you know, I, I'd like to be more relaxed. I'd okay. like to be more relaxed. And go through all 10 points for yourself and breathing. And if you don't want to think any words at all, you can just look around the room instead. Feel your feet on the floor and breathe and tap. And how many times are you tapping for people who can't see this? Yeah, it's like five to 10 times per point, but it's it's really flexible. and it, and and again it's different from person to person someone may not want to tap at all and may if it feels really deeply uncomfortable to tap 
I would try just holding the point instead. Okay. Okay. Some people want to really hit those points. It feels really nice to have a very yeah. firm yeah. tap and some people like a really soft tap. Mm -hmm. As long as that the point is being touched in some way, it's going to work. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so if you tap and you feel it all, like this is making me really uncomfortable, this feels unsafe and something, I'm feeling a little nauseous right now, I don't know what's going on, just stop tapping and go back to simply looking around the room. It might mm -hmm. be your system is, uh, is feeling too sensitive for EFT or things are being kicked up that you're better off um, uh, working on with a trusted practitioner instead. Great. And that's EFT. As I said, it's it's used very flexibly. It's a really it's um it's one of many techniques that have been developed over the last thirty years now to help heal the nervous system. Basically, the it helps repattern the brain response. It helps to break the pattern of um the the original uh, adverse experience that gets stuck in the brain. It helps mm. to re release. It's it's you can think of it as like stuck energy, like the emotion. It's one of the theories. They don't exactly know why it works. I don't think we have the the technology to or the the machines to track what's happening. We do know from research that our brain changes when we tap. Um, there's been great studies done in Australia and the UK where EFT is very popular. That it proves that tapping does in fact change your brain change your nervous system change the hormone flow to bring you back into a state of relaxation wow and it can be used very effectively to get rid of the fears you have completely to actually heal the original uh, adverse experience that you had not to heal the memory but to heal the reaction to the memory okay. so if you think about a time in your life when you you know you felt so afraid or so anxious or so unloved or whatever the eft can help you just re you remember the incident, but uh, with a clear heart, you know, uh, mm -hmm. or you can see it objectively and not have that same, you know, the, the pressure in the body. You might, you know, sometimes we'll get a, like a feeling in the pit of the stomach or we'll feel right. sweaty or we'll um, feel, uh, you know, heavy in our bodies when we remember that memory. And then, feel, then the emotions too, the shame or the guilt or the grief, EFT heals the, re the reaction, those reactions to the memory. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. So for somebody for whom this actually does feel good and it is working and how, how frequently, like, is there a recommended number of times a day, a week you should do it for how long? Yeah. I, I find that people tend to use it when they need it. You know, the days that they're feeling really stressed and anxious, you know, if you, if you need to go, you're, um, you have to go to court that day tapping before mm -hmm. you go in and bring yourself so you can feel is, is what the tapping does is it brings you back to yourself. You know, when we're, we're, we're sort of at, we're literally out of our heads when we're having a triggered re response and when we're hiding or shouting or whatever, we're not, we're not really our, fully ourselves. We are, a, we are a nervous system trying to survive. <laughs> right. right. And, and tapping brings us back to all the things that we are, that we put on our gratitude list, right. On our resource list it brings yeah. us back to remembering who we are. And so tapping beforehand helps us to be in that space and stay there more easily, even when things trigger us. And then there may be times when you feel anxious and you just don't know why. And it's a great tool for that too. Um, something may have happened in the day that triggered your brain and a memory that you don't even have conscious remembrance of. And so the tapping can help um, soothe that anxiety. You need, you need to work with a practitioner probably to really dig out the memory what memories often need witnessing they need to be remembered at least in part in order to be healed fully not necessarily the exact thing that happened but the right. the emotions and the body responses tapping while having those reactions and body responses can deeply heal the nervous system and brain and again when it's something's pretty significant you want to do it with somebody else do it you know with a practitioner to help you through it okay yeah, I remember the first time that I even heard about EFT. I was in that scenario where it was just came out of nowhere, massive anxiety. Mm -hmm. I had left my ex um, and it wasn't even related. To, well, I mean, maybe it was related, right? But it wasn't, there was nothing specific. It was very nonspecific. And somebody sent me something online to tap tap with. Oh. And, it, and it really did help. And I was like, I think I did it twice because I was like, wow, that's amazing that this really did kind of cut through this completely flooded, overwhelmed, out of nowhere. And I was spinning. 
you know, you're just spinning. You're like, what? And I couldn't, couldn't calm down. I couldn't do my work. And, you know, I'm a walker. I would normally go outside. I think it was the middle of the winter, but like, it felt like nothing else was working and it did, it worked. So nice. Yeah. It, I honestly tap, I think I find it's the most healing when you're tapping, when you're having that reaction, because it, it, it they found that for a lot of people, it heals since it's healing and releasing that you're, you're basically pro your body is processing and releasing that reaction. And mm -hmm. so, and every time you do that, you're literally letting go of those emotions and, mm -hmm. and, and out and getting them, getting them out of your system, right? Literally getting them out of your system and letting the body process them safely because you're tapping to keep, so you can keep the feelings in check, but still experience them. And then uh, you do that enough times and you find that you don't react as strongly anymore. Those emotions, even when they come, they aren't overwhelming the next time. Right. Because you released it in some way through the tapping. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. And EFT is just one great, you know, uh, of these body psychotherapies or energy psychology, they call them. I, there's, there's a couple of different names given to these kinds of techniques, but uh, more and more therapists are using techniques like this because they're realizing that talking about some things when you talk about it, it only helps to a point. And then there's no more healing that happens after that. People are, you know, you know, are kind of stuck in their story or just unable to move forward with their lives or for whatever reason. And um, EFT is one of those techniques. Uh, and I think more and more people have heard of EMDR, which mm -hmm. is eye movement desensit desensitization and reprocessing is what it stands okay. for. But it's a very similar um, uh, result as EFT. Okay. It's also to help the, the brain, it's you know, repatterning, right? Reprocessing using, okay. the, using eye movements instead of tapping. Um, and another uh, technique that's become very popular is IFS, which stands mm -hmm. for internal family systems. And it's another somatic therapy. So EF, EFT, EMDR, IFS, the alphabet soup of new techniques. <laughs> Are, um, are, are being seen more and more. So folks who are looking to deeply heal some wounds from childhood or even a more recent experience like a terrible, difficult divorce and, um, and battling with uh, difficult adults in your life, therapists who deal with, who you have those techniques at their disposal, I find are, um, are, are greatly effective. That's awesome. And so what is I, sorry, I just had a bunch of screens pop up. What does IFS, um, you said what it stands for, but what does that look like? What does that entail? Yeah, so IFS works on the uh, uh, the theory, and I, I think we all deeply feel that the truth of this is that we're, we're made out of parts, right? Like you, you think of a DID, dissociative you know, identity disorder, when you have different personalities, but we all have parts, right? There's our childlike part, our creative part, our our whimsical part, the part that um, it wants to fight, you know, the part that wants to um, that wants to go skydiving, and the other part that doesn't want to go skydiving, right? We have, <laughs> yeah. and often it feels can feel like a war inside of we want to do this, but something's holding us back, right. and it's the recognition that there's different parts of us, and that we are born this way with different parts, but the parts end up taking on new roles when we have those adverse childhood experiences. So maybe the part that um, a part of us that deeply loves to be creative um, is shamed because, you know, in, we were in school and we created something and we were laughed at by our peers or the teachers that that's not how you're supposed to do the assignment. And that creative part now takes on a whole different role. It might be to stifle your creativity. Exactly. And so and so it's about identifying those beliefs the, that are um, that we have those internal beliefs and using techniques to help us release those beliefs from our bodies. So helping the creative part heal from that experience. Wow, cool. Yeah, I don't know much about that last one. That's, that's I it's it's fabulous. I'm actually a huge fan. It's become wildly popular. Um, I know many, many, many therapists are now using IFS in uh, in their sessions, and even it's, I know coaches who are taking classes in IFS to help right. people overcome. Because so often when we feel ourselves blocked from a, a, a like we want to do something, but we just feel totally blocked and unable to move forward, it's often a part that's holding us back. And the thing about the parts that I find also beautiful is that 
we may be frustrated by our parts because they shut, shut us down or they hold us back or they get really angry or whatever reaction we're struggling with, but they're always there to keep us safe. So the creative part doesn't want you to be shamed again, right? right. So it stifles your creativity so that you won't be shamed. It's always about protecting you and every part tries to protect you in ways that may not feel very healthy, but it's the only technique it knows and it's sticking to it until right. it's, until it's shown it doesn't need to do that anymore. So, uh, so it's just a really, um, it's a beautifully compassionate way to see ourselves mm -hmm. that, you know, we think we have shame or guilt about our behavior, about what we can or can't do um, and our capabilities, but actually we are, we have all these parts that are always doing their absolute best to help us navigate a world and keep us alive and keep us um, thriving as best we can, given the tools we were given when we were growing up. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Mm -hmm. So that's the last thing that we were saying we wanted to give people is this kind of ability to research the type of therapy that they should be looking for. And you mentioned, well, we've got EFT, EMDR, IFS, somatic therapy maybe i don't know or yeah, informed therapies period is maybe a good google search yeah there's i mean there's other ones there's there's sensory motor therapy there's somatic experiencing there's quite a lot of there's quite a lot of techniques right now i'd say those those three that i mentioned are um the ones that a i'm most familiar with and i've seen most often after people's names when you go through lists of uh practitioners okay. and everything so um and you can find individual ifs counselors and okay. I, um, EFT practitioners like myself and counselors as well, besides not just therapists. Right. Do you feel like the type of person you need differs based on the type of trauma or like in this case, we'll just say abuse. Um, so somebody who has, you know, some sort of physical or sexual abuse, maybe one type of practitioner or modality is better for them than somebody who is screamed at, for example? I think it actually more depends on the therapist um, okay. and who you feel comfortable with. The The therapeutic relationship is the, the part of this that's, I'd say it's the most important part, honestly. It's It yeah. goes back to the polyvagal theory of Stephen Porges, which revolutionized all of this, is that our our sense of safety comes from our relationships. Like we are made to have relationships with each other. And when we find someone who we who feel, makes us feel seen and safe and heard, and we know that they're there for us, then our nervous systems can truly relax and and heal really on their own. Even I mean, that's why talk therapy has has been used successfully for a lot of people is that simply having that loving presence goes a long way to healing the nervous system. So seen, safe, heard. I love that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that basically is saying, don't just stop with the first person that you meet as a therapist, like really, never. And, and it's no harm, no foul, you know, it's, it's nothing wrong with you. It's nothing wrong with them. You're just not a match. And that's mm -hmm. totally fine. You know, I used to be a massage therapist. And um, I, I had tons of people who said, like, St yeah, Stacy, you're amazing in massage therapy. And then other people were like, meh, she's fine. You know, and it's, yeah. It's no harm, no foul. They, we didn't, we weren't a match. We didn't resonate. I didn't quite get them the way they wanted to be gotten. And there's no, no I, I'm one person and I have the people who I, who I connect to and then the people who I don't connect to. And that's going to be true of anybody, of course, be it they're a friendship or a business partner or a therapist and, right. and, and that you deserve the person you feel good with that it, you know, it's often self-care you know, one of the beliefs we are often raised with is that we're not, we don't deserve, we're not deserving, we're not enough, we're not good enough, we're, um, we don't get to have something. And right. other people's needs matter than our, than our own. And I believe the first step of healing is to heal that, that belief mm -hmm. that we don't deserve to be taken care of. Because that's, after that, all else follows, you know, once, once we can accept that we de deserve just as much care and attention and um energy as the next person we're not we're not different from the other eight billion people we are just like everybody else in that respect then we find the practitioners in our lives who can really bring us to the healing that we need and keep looking until you find them yeah totally agree i i'm just thinking of somebody i know who was with a therapist and was not sharing like the thing that she was really in therapy for and i was like why are we even and then finally she did share 
and that person was very upset and she ended up leaving the therapist to find somebody who was more appropriate, but it's like, there's, that was a good example of the reshaming that can come from like, that was the person's ego. Like, how dare you show up here and not tell me your problems kind of thing. And in a reflection of her own, her own, gut, <laughs> her own gut wisdom that this wasn't the right person to share with. Yeah, exactly. Like she didn't feel safe and it's clearly a good reason not to feel safe, but yeah, yeah listening. Yeah learning to trust your gut is huge and um and the more often we do trust our gut the more often our gut will tell us what it thinks about things it's another practice we can have is uh you know, is uh letting ourselves hear the inner wisdom and following it and and the the wisdom just comes out much more clearly the next time it's uh like any other like any other habit we develop yeah yeah, yeah. and that's something that often we need to relearn if we've been in one of these relationships right it's just easy to yeah and the fact is we can you know it's healing is always possible we often think that um you know we we've been irreparably damaged by our childhood by this relationship by this person and it's it's i mean there's physical you know getting blows to the head that, that does do permanent damage but when it comes to the emotional piece there's always healing to be had like oh we can always you know neuroplasticity and so much is shown that our nervous systems are not locked in stone nothing about us is locked in stone and there's always healing available no matter what that's awesome that is the happy <laughs> happy thought of the day for sure i love yes, that absolutely yeah yeah it's about finding the right person and not giving up and i think that's the thing sometimes you feel pushed or you don't have enough time and i know like when you're maybe you're working you're in court you have children it's like you're you're like, can I really interview five different practitioners? And it's like, it's worth it. It's better to take that time than to jump in with one person that you feel kind of meh, <laughs> as you said, because it's probably not going to do you. It's going to be a waste of your time down the road. Yeah. It, it definitely could be. And it's, it's yeah. one more thing to schedule and modern life doesn't make it easy, but um, yeah. um, it's certainly worth it. And yeah. And often when we when we list, list our resources, sometimes we may find things on that list that uh, we can access asking for help as well in order to mm -hmm. help you know, or, or asking for help from the people in our lives. So we can get to that therapy appointment. So we can get a moment to ourselves when we need to just ground and connect. And, and before we go back, dive back into taking care of our children and families and businesses and everything. Right. Oh, that's a really good point. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We need, we need people. We need people to ask for help. For sure. Yes, absolutely. And that includes internal help. Like, and that's and what I love about these practices. It's remembering we always have an internal source of help. Like we are, we are our own best advocate when we access sure. that part of ourselves and you know, we have, we have the wise, the wise, calm center. We can always go back once we find that wise, calm center. Be it through, you know, whatever practices we choose to engage in, it's we have an internal resource. It's available to us at any time, anywhere we are, no matter what we're doing. And of course, we ask for help from other people as well, and we always have ourselves to rely on as well. Oh, I love that. Yes, <laughs> you're your own best advocate for sure, and nobody knows you like you do. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Even if you feel like you don't know yourself yet, you probably know yourself way better than anybody else. So. Well, it's an endless, it's one of those endless mysteries of life as we get to learn everything. We'll never know everything about ourselves before we die. And there's always something new to learn. And uh, I think it's a important thing to remember is that we're not supposed to know everything, not even about ourselves. And it's actually a, a part of the joy of life is we will never know everything. And there's always more to explore and to see it as a, an adventure. Uh, rather than a burden or um, or see it with fear to see it with the learning opportunity that it is because one thing about these terrible experiences that we have in our lives is it's it, they're gateways to real wisdom mm -hmm. and understanding about ourselves and the world and 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 the and the broader you know ideas of acceptance and forgiveness and compassion and self-acceptance and um, everything that comes with with learning how to love after being mm -hmm. in a situation where you felt unloved it's uh it's a journey that's uh, really rich and it's hard to see when you're in it and you're suffering. And I get that. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's the pain and suffering is terrible. And also there is hope on the other side of it, the opportunity for healing and growth and wisdom and love. Oh, beautifully stated. Yeah. Cracks us open for sure. And there's just uh, like, it's just 
stretches us. I think, you know, that's the thing when you're, especially in the very beginning, you're like, what? Well, I didn't ask for this. But then later you're like, thank God this happened to me because I wouldn't have known that I could have these kinds of rich relationships that I could have this kind of love or this kind of autonomy and freedom or whatever it is that you're looking for or peace, harmony, excuse me, all of it. Yeah, you wouldn't know until these kinds of things help kind of unleash this other chapter in your life. <laughs> Chapters, yeah. Chapters, Chapters. absolutely. absolutely. Yes. Stacy, how can people contact you and find out what's the best way to find out more about you? And yeah, yeah thanks. I have a website. Um, it's my name. So stacyevery.com, S T A C Y E V E R Y.com. And uh, all my contact information is on there. I do um, free consultations if people are interested in learning more about what I do. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions in general. People are interested. Awesome. And so now are you able to do only in Massachusetts, your Massachusetts Bates, but can you help people who are not in Massachusetts or? I'm actually exclusively on Zoom right now, so I can help anybody anywhere. Sure. Yep, it's one of the joys of Zoom. In fact, I know several EFT practitioners who uh, they don't have anyone in their own state. <laughs> they only work with folks outside. And I, I do phone, I'll do phone sessions as well if people would prefer okay. to be on phone. Some people don't like Zoom and that's totally sure. fine. Okay, I wasn't sure of that because I heard somebody say the other day that you had to be like in this state to get some sort of coverage. Maybe it's specific I types think of coverage. For a second, yeah, if you're looking to be covered by insurance, insurance companies would insurance. Probably require you to have someone in your in your network in your state um, in order okay. to have. In, uh, I don't take insurance, so I don't have to worry about that. But okay, for so that's an issue for therapists. Right, got it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stacey. This was really, really helpful. I feel much better about having tools in our toolbox kind of thing. So great. Really grateful for everything you shared. And oh, you're very welcome. I'm so pleased to be here. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, me too. Great. Well, have a great day. Thank you. You too.